Rashmika. Younger Mal Hakis Mida. Me and Hanida. Your language is a beautiful one. So is your city. Tegu. Arundap Sanida. Song Malo. You probably all know that your bodies are made up of billions of very tiny living cells. And if you studied any biology, even popular biology, you will know that people know that inside those very tiny cells there are very tiny molecules, some of which are called DNA. Much of that is described as what we call genes. And one of the most popular books in biology, published around 40 years ago, was published actually by a professor who trained at this college, Richard Dawkins, his book, The Selfish Gene. Has anybody read The Selfish Gene? I didn't read, but my school students read. Many students read. That's important. Probably that's so. Now, you'll know also if you've read that book, but I'm going to tell you if you haven't, that one of the themes of that book is that those genes, that DNA, made you. Body and mind. That's a quote from The Selfish Gene. Now, before I go into the stories from my little book, I want to perform an experiment. I can't do it here in the college, but I could do something like it in the laboratory. I want you to imagine that I take one of those very tiny cells and I pull all the DNA out of it. We can extract DNA now. How people, of course, get to know about the genetics of many different species. Now, suppose I put that DNA into a little glass dish. Scientists call them Petri dishes. And I put there as many nutrients and substances as you wish. I could keep it for 10,000 years. It would do absolutely nothing whatsoever. So there's something wrong. It can't be the case that genes created us body and mind. Something has to tell those molecules to do what they do. Now the reason for that is very, very simple, but is also very profound. It is that if you ask the question, <coughs> what is life, it's one of the most fundamental questions you can ask one of the deepest metaphysical, religious and spiritual questions. What is life? It's not a set of molecules. Because as I said, those molecules on their own do nothing. They're dead. So what is it? What could life possibly be? Well, the other possibility, if it isn't the individual molecules, it must be how they talk to each other, how they interact. In other words, life must be a process. And the origin of my little book is based on taking a rather different metaphor for living systems, and I call it the music of life. And the reason for that is the following. Music also is not just a set of notes. 
you, you can find the score of one of Bach's great cantatas or Beethoven's symphony and you'll see all the notes written there on the music page but that's not the music it's only music when some musicians play it and that is a process and they give life to those dead notes on the page so let's have a look at the metaphor the music of life when Oxford University Press that published this book were looking for a cover they came up with this extraordinary image and you can ask some questions about it is it an insect it might be a butterfly or is it a violin and of course it's neither or both depending on how you look at it and it was actually made by famous Japanese paper artist Hideharu Naito you notice too that although the instrument if that's what it is is being played there is a bow there there's no player the processes of music play themselves they require a, a performer of course who's good to play but still they arise from their interactions they are processes now I want to tell you a little story a few days ago before preparing to give this talk to you I was relaxing in my room at home and I put on a CD of one of my favorite pieces of music and I started playing it Some of you may recognize this as one of the most beautiful pieces from Schubert. And as the music enters this slow movement, which we're playing at the moment, I cried. And we must all have pieces of music or poetry or other forms of art which produce that effect in us. Now I want you to imagine another experiment. In my room I imagine that some visitors from outer space have arrived in the room. In my book I call them Silmans because I imagine that these living beings are made of silicon in the way we're made of carbon. Some people think that life could be based on silicon, we don't know. But it's a good thought experiment. They're very good experimenters, they're very good scientists, and they study the situation and they see this person in the room crying and they ask the question, why does he cry? So, as good scientists, they start to do some experiments. They find that, of course, there are sound waves traveling in the room, which is what's enabling us to hear the music. So, they start doing some thinking about that. They find two big boxes, which you and I would call loudspeakers, and they can see the sound waves are coming out of their speakers. So they trace the speakers through their leads back to another box, which we would call an amplifier. And then suddenly, one of them has a moment in which he says, I've got it. I know what makes him cry. He says, 
connect to that amplifier is another little box and inside that box there's a disc turning and what's on that disc it's just a set of numbers so they all look a bit puzzled how can a set of numbers produce not only music but him crying the Silman who's made the discovery though he defends his position he says well it's obvious isn't it I can change the loudspeakers I can change the amplifiers I can even change the ZD player but if I play around with those numbers on the disc I get some very strange results suppose for example I play it too slowly he no longer cries if I play it backwards he certainly no longer cries if I place into it some numbers from another disc it gets even worse and if I mutate those numbers I change some of them he no longer appreciates the music in fact he goes to the CD player he pulls the CD out of the box and throws it away now we can laugh at our visitors from outer space they saw a very simple explanation there are some numbers on that CD and if you play around with that just as if you make mutations in DNA you can cause changes in the organism just as you would cause changes in the music in fact you destroy the music it wouldn't any longer be musical we can laugh at them and say well it's obvious isn't it I mean the reason he's crying is that Schubert played and composed some heart tugging emotional music and the other reason he's crying is that he probably associates that music with something in his life which association gives him the feeling that he wishes to cry so what's wrong here as I said it's easy for us to laugh at some visitors from outer space thinking they've got a very simple explanation of what was going on during that music and me sitting on the sofa and crying but when we laugh at them we're really laughing at ourselves because every time we say there's a gene for this for cancer there's a gene for that heart attack there's a gene for that diabetes and so on and so on we're making exactly the same mistake it's the meaning of the associations of the relationships between the components of living systems that gives life life therefore we can ask the question what directs it is it genes this of course is the famous double helix discovered by the Nobel Prize winners Watson and Crick here in the United Kingdom in 1953 or is it not rather that it's the organism itself that plays the genes just the other way round in fact you can see them in a nice play on the English language as the pipes in a huge organ of course our bodies contain organs hearts, livers and so on and of course the word organ is also in the word for a living creature an organism so the analogy I draw is that the set of genes in a living organism is rather like the set of pipes 
in a huge organ which has to be played by the organist in order to produce the beautiful music written by Bach. And now the other very interesting thing is that the largest organ in the world, which is in the United States, it's in Philadelphia, has a number of pipes which happens coincidentally to be roughly the same as the number of genes in the human genome. In other words, somewhere around 25 or 30,000. Now what does that mean? And I'm going to tell you another story from the book. I call this the story of the Chinese emperor. You can, if you like, think of it as the first emperor of China who united China 2,200 years ago into the large country that we know it is today. And in order to achieve that, of course, he had to fight many very difficult battles. Now, one of them, the emperor was nearly killed by soldiers who attacked him, and he was saved from that attack by the farmer who was a soldier, as well as being a farmer. That's where the emperor recruited many of his farmers, of course. And so afterwards he calls the farmer to his palace to reward him. So the farmer comes and he bows down before the emperor in his palace, and the emperor says to him, you saved my life, I'll give you anything you wish. Have a look around my palace. So the farmer thinks a little bit. He gets up and he asks the question, Sir, do you have a chessboard? The emperor, of course, is rich. He has many. Now, I should say at this point that this story is a little bit out of sync with history. Of course, chess was invented in India, not in China. But let's forget that little detail. It's just a story. OK. So, the courtiers go and they find the most elaborate chessboard in the palace. And they bring it in and they place it carefully on the floor of the palace in front of the emperor and between him and the farmer. And the farmer feels inside his pocket. Inside his pocket he has a bunch of rice grains. In fact he pulls out 15 rice grains together with the dirt of his pocket. And he walks towards the chessboard and the emperor interrupts him. He says, not going to throw the dirt of your pocket on my beautiful chessboard. Then, no, sir, watch what happens. In fact, what he does is to throw one rice grain on the first square of the board. Remember, this board has 64 squares. It doesn't seem very many. You'll see in a moment that it is. He puts two on the next square and the emperor thinks, well, maybe he thinks you should use rice grains as your chess pieces. So he asks the courtiers to bring out the most elaborate and beautiful chess pieces in the palace. And they do. The farmer completely ignores him. He puts four rice grains on the next square. And then he puts eight on the next square. And those of you who have a little bit of mathematical knowledge will begin to see what is happening. This is a series of doubling each time. The emperor, of course, is by now completely convinced that the farmer is a bit naive, though he was very clever 
in saving his life. But the farmer turns to him and he says, Sir, I'm just a poor farmer. There's not much I can do with your extremely expensive chessboard using precious woods and your chess pieces. I tell you what, if you just finish this series that I started with rice grains, I'll just take the rice you can keep the beautiful chessboard and pieces. So the emperor is now completely convinced that the farmer doesn't know what he's doing. He's been offered anything in the palace and all he asks for is a few rice grains. So he commands his courtiers to see what they can do. They bring a 200 kilogram bag of rice onto the palace floor. It took four of them to bring it up and they thump it down on the ground and start the tedious process. And of course, what goes on to the next square will be 16, 32. You can do the mathematics. <laughs> and by the middle of the next row, or the row after that, they're already putting a thousand rice grains on each square. So someone has a brilliant idea. I'll tell you what we'll do, we'll make a scoop that can pick up about a thousand grains and we use that rather than counting out all the rice grains. So they do that and they carry on and by the end of that row there are up to 30 such scoops and even worse by the middle of the next row there are up to three million rice grains. In fact all the 200 kilograms of rice has gone. So they look at the emperor and say, what do we do now? So he says, there's no problem. There was a magnificent harvest. We have many other bags. Go and get another 20 bags and bring them up. So they carry on trying to put, well they can't put 3 million rice grains of course on a single square. What they're doing now is to put piles of rice on the palace floor. They end up though going down into the storeroom and by square 36 they find that all the rice in the palace is gone. By square 50 all the rice in China <laughs> has gone. By square 64 they would be filling the earth this deep in rice all over the surface of the earth. One of them goes to the emperor and says, Sir, the farmer has won. Uh, you are ruined. He goes white with shock. But the farmer says to him, Sir, you're a great man. You know many things. But even you don't understand the full extent of the world. Now, why do I tell you this story? We're now going to return to genes. Remember, I said that there are about 30,000 genes in the human genome. So we can do a calculation. This time, we'll have a square, a chessboard if you like, of 30,000 squares. Now ask how many processes, how many combinations, how many forms of music, if you want that metaphor, could that produce? Well, to start off with a very simple assumption, there are no functions in biological systems. Heartbeat, pancreatic function, liver function, and so on. Nothing depends on just two genes. But it's very instructive if you make that assumption initially, it's absurd, but the number would be this one, and it's 300 million. So already, by just talking about one gene interacting with another, and any of them interacting with each other, and just two of them, you get 300 million. You can make more realistic assumptions. When I do research in which I reconstruct 
the heartbeat, the rhythm of the heart, I need about a hundred components, if you like, the components formed by around a hundred genes. If you do that, you get an enormous number, 10 to the nearly 300. That's 10 multiplied by itself, 300 times. And of course, you don't have to stick with that. You can ask what would happen if you allow all combinations to occur. The answer is 10 to the 70,000. Now, these are numbers that get to be so unimaginable that we have to give you some idea of how big they are. So I decided the best way to do that was to compare it with the size of the universe. We now know that because a number of years ago, scientists put a very powerful telescope into space. It's called the Hubble Telescope. It's so powerful that if you look at a fairly dark part of the sky, it's only about one twenty-five millionth of the total size of the sky. So it's a very tiny part of the sky. In that part, there are only four stars normally visible. And what they did was very clever. They allowed the telescope to collect light from that little area of the sky for a few days, and then for a whole week. And what they found was astonishing. Many, many more appear. You can't see these are the naked eye. And as you go on for a whole week, you're seeing tens of thousands. And these are not stars. These are galaxies, each with trillions of stars in each. We've now, with such methods, we've now been able to reach back to close to the origin of the universe, distant about 13 billion years ago. Just to put that in context, the Earth is a little over 4 billion years old, so it was formed actually quite late during that process. Life has been here for about 3 billion years. We've been here just for a few thousand. We are, as it were, as humans, the last few seconds of life on Earth. Now we can ask a question. We know roughly the total number of stars in a galaxy, total number of atoms in a star, so we can begin to calculate the total number of atoms in the universe as a whole. And the question is, would it be larger or smaller than that number of interactions that are possible between genes? The answer is amazing. There wouldn't be enough material in the whole universe for nature to have tried out all the possible interactions, even over the long period of billions of years of the evolutionary process. The idea, therefore, that we can pursue that metaphor, they created us, body and mind, is based on an impossible calculation. We will never be able to do that calculation. It's far too big. So we have to look somewhere else. And as I said at the beginning of the talk, it's best to look for it in the processes and I'm going to finish with just two more stories. One is to return to the idea of the Silmans again. I use them a lot in my little book. This time they come to Earth and find some tropical islands. More than one, in fact. And as they look at each island, they find something very surprising. All the organisms on that island have exactly the same genome. For those of you who know your biology, that means they're clones of one genome. Cloning is now, of course, a standard method in biology. 
So I find this very puzzling. Particularly because they're all different. Each of those organisms does something quite different. Some have got long threads that communicate one to another. Others have got muscles that enable them to move. And so on and so on. Some of them can actually build structures like bone. Now, this is very strange because that means with the same genome we find at least 200 different types of organism. And they remember there was a big argument on Earth 100 to 200 years ago between Charles Darwin, the great evolutionary biologist, and Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, the great French biologist, about whether that kind of thing was possible. So, they do some experiments, and they notice, as they investigate a particular group of islands, that some of them come very close together. They even move. They are intelligent enough, as Silmans, to know that continents have moved on the Earth over the hundreds of millions of years. And then they notice something very interesting between these neighbouring islands. Because what they find is that they communicate and a bridge is built. And as the bridge is built, there's a huge volcanic explosion and a little bit later, another island appears. Now, I don't know whether anybody has yet realised but this is not a story about islands on Earth. It's a story about your body. Does that lead anybody to think what must be going on here? So, I'll carry on. What's happening here, of course, is that the Silmans, they're so tiny that they take a complete organism, like you and me, as like an island. Now, in your body and mine, there are, in fact, about 200 types of cell. Some of them are cardiac rhythm cells. Some of them are pancreatic cells controlling sugar. Others are the liver metabolizing many things in the body. Some of them form muscles, nerves, and so on. And they all have the same genome. Again, something is telling those genes to do something different in each of those cases. And of course, when they observe what is happening, they realise what is going on. The island is, of course, the interaction of two humans to make a new one, which, of course, requires the fertilisation of an egg by a sperm. And I want to finish with one more story and then we can switch to questions. But this time, I imagine that we are the space travellers and we travel all the way to Jupiter, to one of its moons. And as we descend down onto the moon, it's thought there might be life on some of the moons of Jupiter. We discover, and we're the first humans to discover this new world. And we discover something very interesting. There are living beings on this world, intelligent beings. Moreover, 
They have built magnificent structures that we might call cathedrals. They are, of course, ornate treasures. And so the space travelers discover also that there's the equivalent of priests dressed in very elaborate robes. And so they send a message, the travelers that is, back to Earth to say, this is very strange, we, we found God up here. So the thinkers on Earth reflect on what they're being told and they send a message to the space travellers as quickly as possible, learn the language, find out what they know. And so they do. They find that the Jupiterians practice a special form of prayer. There are scriptures actually 52 million words, 84,000 books carefully kept. And they ask the question of the Jupiterians, what about God? What about the cause of all of us? And their reply is, hmm, that's no thing. You remember what I said at the beginning? No thing, a process instead. That's the basic message of what I'm saying to you. And when it comes to the self, that also is a process. I think that what makes you, you, rather than me, is not the molecules in your body. Those molecules could have been in my body. It's the processes that occur that make you who you are and form the self. And of course one of them points out that a famous philosopher on earth once wrote the statement, I think therefore I am. That was Descartes of course, the famous French 17th century philosopher. And they reply, well you don't need to say that. Why have the I there? Just thinking, so being. If there's thinking, there must be a process. Now, of course, some of you may already have recognized, because this is not Jupiter at all, it's not a moon of Jupiter, it's somewhere not very far from Tegu. Can anybody guess where it is? Hey in Sa. It is precisely Hey in Sa in Korea. Now, why do I tell you this story and of course you, many of you will recognize this magnificent building where the extraordinary set of books is stored. The reason I tell you the story is this. There are many metaphysical questions we can ask about what is life and what am I, what are you, and we all have our own ways of answering that kind of question. That's the function, of course, of religion. And there are many religions. The important point, and you in Korea will know this very well because you live together with two of the great religions, both Buddhism and Christianity. And they have a very different interpretation of precisely that kind of question. My point is not to say which is right or which is wrong. It's to say think about it. It's not so certain that we know what we are. And so I finished my little book with a lovely statement from the great Italian artist, painter, drawer, architect, sculptor, Leonardo da Vinci. No words are needed for those who understand music. And he also wrote, do you not know that our soul is composed of harmony? 
It's precisely, of course, the concept of the music of life. You will recognise these images, some of you, from a very famous set of Chinese drawings called the Ox Herd a Parable. And in one of the drawings, the circle is completely empty. That's, of course, the concept of no thing. So I finish the lecture. Thank you very much for listening. Kamsa Hamidah.